And I'd like to welcome everyone out here to the Oceanside Potter's House for our Sunday evening service. Why don't we stand to our feet? Let's begin to clap our hands and lift our voice as we worship our Lord and Lord and King of Kings this evening. We're going to sing out this song together. I feel the spirit move. I feel the spirit moving and that's all right. I feel the spirit moving and that's all right. I feel the spirit moving. Look what the Lord has done. And look what the Lord has done. 
worship the Lord, the Lord and King of Kings. We thank you, Lord. Amen. As we slow it down tonight, let's continue to lift our voice together in agreement in one accord. As we lift our hands and show a surrenderance, we're going to sing out this song of worship together all to Jesus.
Quest up here, amen. Let's pray healing for little Tracy's daughter. She's been sick, so let's uh, lift her up in prayer. Also praying for Karina McKee, Troy, Ivan, and Jack, who are all battling a cold, flu, symptoms, and the rest of the family is at home taking care of them. So let's uh, uh, lift them up in our prayers. Let's also continue to pray for all those who are visiting relatives. Our pastor, Pastor Tim Moynihan, his wife, they're visiting relatives, amen. So let's pray that God's hand of protection will be over them as well as they come back as they return. Let's also lift up the Jalberts who are visiting their families. Let's also pray for Stephen and his daughter, uh, Kariana, amen, as they're also visiting in, in uh, Alaska. And so let's pray. Let's lift up, Brother Steve. Amen. So let's lift up Diane, amen. And if the ladies want to uh, lay hands on her, her ankle, let's pray for her. <laughs> amen. And also for Autumn, right? Where's Autumn at? There, there's Autumn right there, too. So let's, let's lay hands on her, amen. Uh, continue to pray for Pastor Rob as well as he's recovering from his surgery. Pastor Tim as he recovers from his surgery. Let's believe in God for all the pregnant ladies, amen. And so let's pray that God uh, would uh, protect the baby, give them healthy uh, babies and also a healthy pregnancy. Let's also pray for our fellowship, amen. believing in God, amen, for leadership, Praying that God will continue to move, especially in this next conference, amen, all the, de all the delegates that are going. Let's pray that God would move, amen, and that uh, many churches will be launched from this conference coming up. Let's also pray for uh, 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 Fallbrook, pray for San Marcos, pray for Pakistan. Let's lift them up in our prayers, believing God for all these needs. You have a personal need, you would acknowledge that before God, amen. Let's pray. Let's believe in God. Let's lift our voices to heaven. When we subside, I'm going to ask my brother Jonathan Garcia up in the crow's nest to open us up in prayer. Let's begin to pray. Take time and greet one another in this place.
Welcome out to the Potter's House Christian Fellowship here in Oceanside, California, beautiful Oceanside City, amen. Those of you that are joining us online, I want to welcome you as well, and I'd rather have you here in person than online, obviously, but you're joining us, so I, I do want to thank you for that. And so I do have a few announcements to make. I am not the pastor. My name is Eric, but uh, our pastor is right now with his family, and so if you do want to contact him, all the information is in the back, and it's got a uh, pastor's number on there. And if there's something that's not so pressing and you would like to talk to Pastor Rob and myself, we are available. And so we'll try to help you as much as we can. Amen? Amen. All right. This is our Sunday evening worship service. Service started at 6 p.m. The doors were open at 5 for prayer. I do encourage you to come, pray, get a hold of God. Let him help you, man. It starts in the prayer room. You know, it seems like uh, we'll stand up and say that every time. And, you know, actually, and I see it growing. I like that. I like that. So we just need some more people, you know. You know, when, you, when you're firing up the grill, the more coals, the hotter it gets. That's how it is in the prayer room as well. The more people get in there, the hotter and the more fire you feel, man. And so I, I felt it today. It was exciting. And so I do encourage you to come join us for prayer. Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we do have a Bible study. Uh, Pastor wasn't here today, so obviously we couldn't do the Bible study today. But we will, the Bible studies will resume when he comes back. And so please be here at 9 for prayer, 10 for the Bible study, 11 is our morning worship service, and so I encourage you to come. Make it to all these uh, events. I know, you know, it's, it's your whole Sunday. Why don't you just give your whole entire Sunday to Jesus? Yeah. And for that matter, your Saturday. Yeah. Oh, not that many amens there, right? Hey, the Saturdays are mine, Pastor. <laughs> anyway, so um, midweek service at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights, service uh, uh, or excuse me, doors are open at 6 for prayer. And so listen, there's nothing on the calendar starting Monday all the way through the Wednesday, obviously. But then on the 31st, we're having our Happy New Year's party. And so this is our party, amen? You remember when uh, you weren't saved, right? So if you could do that for the devil, why don't you come over here for Jesus? Don't go hanging out. With your deviled family. Oh, I just offended some of you. But they only just drink a little bit. I know. That's the problem. And then a little bit turns into a lot of it. And so some of you have saved family. That's the best family to have. I mean, praise God for that. But for those of you that don't have saved family, you want to be with your saved family here. We are your family. We're going to be here. Amen. And so come join us. That's the 31st. And Josh told me earlier today, you have plenty of time to prepare a skit or a song. Bring all your, all your no talent. We'll take it all. Right, Brother Austin Moses? So we'll take all your no talent. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> no, brother, I, I pick on him because he is very talented, amen? Brother is talented. And so bring it all, though, amen? Bring even your good talent. So we want to hear it as well. Bring your talent and your no talent. We'll be here for it. Amen. And so that's the 31st. We're going to pray in the new year. And so join us for that. Also, just a few more uh, 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 announcements. We do have the uh, January Winter Bible Conference in Prescott, Arizona. The delegates, you already know who you are. And so that starts the 10th through the 14th. Everyone else, you should be praying for us so that um, God will do a miracle. Amen. Also, we have the uh, uh, revival coming up with Evangelist Frankie Chi from the 16th through the 19th. And so we have confirmation of flyers yet? Not yet? Not right now, but we will soon. Uh, and you'll have some flyers in your hands to invite everybody that you can. Amen? And so with that said, uh, I believe those are all the announcements I have to make. Let's give God praise as we take up an offering. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Life is a dot. Eternity is a line. Follow me for a minute, okay? Life is a dot. Eternity is a line. I'm going to quote a man by the name of Randy Alcorn. I read a book called Money, Possessions, and Eternity. This is an excerpt from that book. It says this. As believers in Christ, our theology gives us perspective. 
tells us that this life is the preface, not the book. It's the preliminaries, not the main event. It's the tune-up, not the concert. When you're on a long airplane flight, you naturally talk to people, socialize, eat, read, pray, sleep, or maybe talk about where you're going. But what would you think if a passenger by the window seat started hanging curtains over the window, taped photographs to the seat in front of him, painted murals, and put up wall hangings? You'd think, hey, it's not a long trip, right? Maybe you've done that before, right? No one here does it. But think about that for a minute. You're on a plane ride somewhere. I don't care how long your plane ride is. You're not going to do that. You're not going to hang up curtains. You're not going to tape up you know, pictures of your kids and your family and stuff. Start painting, making it look like your own. I'm remodeling. Remodeling your seat, you know. See, we don't do that. It doesn't matter how long the plane ride is you know it's going to be very short compared to the rest of your life or even compared to the time that you're going to be wherever your, de your destination is. I think of our lives, this is Randy Alcorn, he says, I think of our lives in terms of a dot and a line signifying two phases. Our present life on earth is the dot. It begins, it ends, it's brief. However, from the dot... A line extends that goes on forever. That line is eternity. Which Christians will spend in heaven. Think about that for a minute. This line will extend forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It will never end. Right now we're living in the dot though. Right at this moment, we're living in the dot. But what are you living for? The short-sighted person lives for the dot. The person with perspective lives for the line. This earth and our time here is the dot. Our beloved bridegroom, the coming wedding, the great reunion, and our eternal home in the new heavens and new earth. They're all on the line. The person who lives for the dot lives for treasures on earth that end in the junkyard. You know, I know some of you guys bought some nice Christmas gifts. I know, I personally know a person that actually got a Harley Davidson. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I told my wife that's what I wanted for Christmas. But you know what? One day, even that nice Harley is going to end up in the junkyard. Yeah. I don't care what you drive. Yeah. One day, it's going to end up in the junkyard. Amen. Maybe you already think it belongs there. But that's, a, that's beside the point. <laughs> You're praying for a new car, and that's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. But what I'm trying to get at is you're going to have to have an eternal perspective. Everything that you have now. Everything that you see is temporal. The person who lives for the line lives for treasures in heaven that never end. Giving is living for the line. Are you ready? I'm talking about ready to give. Amen. Have you reached into your wallet yet? I don't see hands moving. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> there you go, sis. Good job. <laughs> See, because th this is the thing that we need to understand, folks. This dot comes and goes. It's like a vapor, the Bible says, remember? But our giving, our giving that we do here, it's for an eternity, guys. We can't take it with us anyway. Remember, pa Pastor says this all the time. <laughs> We can't take it with us. Matthew 6.20 says this. 
Very familiar portion of scripture. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. And where thieves do not break through nor steal. Let's bow our heads. Let's bow our heads. I'm, I'm going to ask Brother Will if he can bless both gift and giver this evening. Amen. Let's sing this song. to mention if you're online please go to the potter's house oceanside.com and just hit the give button or the click on the, the the give button and it'll take you there to a site where you can actually give with either your credit card or paypal however you choose amen but i challenge you to do that as well and so without further delay amen we're going to have our evangelist awesome message this morning you're in for a treat once again so let's welcome him as he comes up evangelist mike Bethia. hallelujah <laughs> Um, volume, Matt, cut me down like half of that because <laughs> I don't need as much, amen. Got a big mouth. So if you have your Bibles, amen, we'll be reading from Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Appreciate, again, the opportunity here. Glad some of you came back. Didn't know I was going to be here. So this is probably why you came back. But <laughs> I'm glad that you're here, amen. Believe God to help us here uh, this evening. Here uh, in today's society, a, a lot of times our mindset is what propels us to where we're going to go at and what we're going to do in life uh, and how things are, are moved as far, uh, as, far, as far as how we're going to be moving and going in life. Uh, here, um, many years ago, you might have heard about this one uh, particular basketball player. He since has retired. Uh, um, his name is um, Shaquille O'Neal. So what had happened is while he was um, playing uh, as what was going on with a lot of um, uh, players uh, that even goes on to this day, they get these shoe deals. And so they're going back to the times when uh, Michael Jordan had first uh, had gotten his shoe deal with Nike and all that. And so a lot of times these um, young men, as they're coming into the league, they already uh, have something lined up with some shoe company uh, or they're in the process of doing that uh, as they're there. Uh, and so what happened is that Shaquille O'Neal uh, was just getting ready to sign this one contract, uh, I think it was with uh, Adidas, I believe, uh, but it was with a particular shoe company uh, and it was going to be for $40 million dollars as he's coming in. And so um, he's there and he's going to the meeting and uh, he had left out the meeting in his mind. He's already going to sign the shoe deal. Uh, but he's leaving from the area that he's at, the hotel or wherever the meeting place was. Uh, and as he's going, uh, he runs to this one particular um, lady, amen, because he had already had some um, other shoes uh, um, deals that he was trying to line up. And, she, and he sees her and, and she uh, gets his attention. She's like, hey, how come your shoe's so expensive? And so um, he's like, hey, lady, I don't, I don't make the terms and stuff how the shoes are. I just, you know, I just, they just use my, uh, my, my, uh, my likeness, my name and stuff to sell the shoe and stuff. She's like, yeah, but, but it's your name that's on there. My son can afford those, those high-priced shoes. You guys make those shoes too high-priced. And he's like, lady, you know, you got to talk to the company, man. I, you know, she just happened to catch him, and she starts telling him, how can anybody afford the kind of shoes that you guys are putting out for us uh, uh, people of lower income or middle income? We can't do that. You should be ashamed of yourself. 
and walks away. Now, obviously, this woman was a particular ethnicity, I would say. And so here it is. <laughs> He's talking to her, and that did something in his mind. He was thinking about it on the ride home, came back the next day to that meeting, and he told him, I'm not going to sign that contract because we're making our shoes too expensive. He instead uh, had gotten with one of the um, men that was starting his own company at the time. He used to work with Nike, and so they helped design another shoe. Uh, and you can find them today at Walmart, 30 bucks, 20 bucks for those Shaquille O'Neal shoes. Got his little logo on him, him slamming on the, on the basketball rim. And all that happened because of a, a conversation he had with one <laughs> a, a woman that was kind of irritated about it costed too much for her son. Changed his mindset. He said, since then, man, even though my shoes are so much cheaper, I've, way, I've made way more than I would on that $40 million contract. It changed his mindset and his perspective. The title of my sermon is, Where is Your Mindset Taking You? We're going to read out of Genesis chapter 4, start reading in verse 3 through 6, a very familiar portion of scripture. Genesis chapter 4, 3 through 6. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Let's just pray. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, we so thank you for your unfallible word. Uh, God, I pray, God, the Holy Ghost would have right of way. Uh, help us, Lord Father God, to gain your perspective, Lord Father God, not only on life, uh, but what you would have us to do uh, in these last days, Lord God. Fill us with your spirit, Lord God. Uh, let our words, Lord God, touch a generation, Lord God, uh, that see you make it uh, and do your will and purposes in the earth. Uh, and we so thank you, Lord Father God, for all that you're doing. Uh, and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' precious name. Uh, and all God's people said... Uh, Amen. Where is your mindset taking you? Here in these verses of scripture, very familiar, uh, God is speaking to Cain um, and he told him that, that sin desire is for you, um, wants to overtake you, uh, wants to have dominion or rule over you. I don't think Cain woke up that day or that morning thinking uh, what he was thinking was going to happen uh, to his life. I don't think that he thought that day as he got up uh, that I'm going to take my, uh, my own brother, uh, my own flesh and blood uh, out from around here. Here it is, beloved. Uh, something had happened uh, in, Cain's, in, in Cain's life. Uh, his perspective was changed. Uh, and here it is. Uh, God Almighty begins to speak into this man's life. Uh, and he begins to tell them, amen, uh, I'm not accepting this offering. You knew what was expected of you. And here it is. Uh, God says, amen, uh, that uh, I'm not accepting this. And he was, he was mad. He was mad at God. And here it is. God says, why have this continents felt fallen? I know a lot of times it's kind of hard to visualize what is going on right here. Uh, but just think of your own kids. Uh, when they want something, you tell them, no. That's that continence you might see around them. <laughs> That's what God was um, catching here with Cain. And he said, why are you mad, man? You know, just break it down to 2021. What's up with you, man? <laughs> why, why are you acting like, why are y'all uh, upset? All I say is I ain't accepting this. Just do right, and you'll be accepted. But he tells them uh, that sin lies at the door of your heart, uh, and it wants to overtake you uh, or has, uh, wants to have dominion over you. And basically what God is saying is that uh, there's something going on with your heart, Cain. There's something wrong with your mindset. Uh, and you haven't uh, committed any uh, wrongdoing physically, uh, but something is, uh, is bubbling in your heart and spirit. And it wants to overtake you. It wants to have dominion over you. God tries uh, to speak into this man's life uh, and to change uh, what he was thinking and going on in his heart and spirit. Is there anyone that could still speak into your life? Is there a brother or a sister or your spouse or, or someone, a pastor, a coach, anyone that can speak into your life and you won't get miss, uh, uh, pissed off about it and say, you know what, forget you. That you won't walk away from that. Is there anyone that can say, uh, you're going the wrong way, man. You're going the wrong way, sis. 
You need to change what's going on in your life. Here it is, uh, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, when he was first going into this endeavor, uh, somebody he didn't even know uh, was able to speak into this young man's life uh, and change his perspective. Uh, $40 million is a lot of money, man. <laughs> That's a lot of money just to walk away from the table from. But it changed this young man's perspective at the time. And here it is, uh, God Almighty was trying to speak to Cain. Now, I don't know what Cain and Abel spoke about. The Bible doesn't say but I dare say, knowing human nature, here it is. Cain begins to, he's mad at God, but he can't take out his anger to God, but he could take it out on his brother. And a lot of times, uh, those that are trying to do the will of God, trying to do right, uh, we begin to uh, snark at them or say uh, snide remarks or, or what we want to call in today's society, mocking them. Begin to come against that. Begin to minimize whatever it is that God is trying to do in their lives. And here it is in this verse of scripture that was reading here that God was speaking to him and he was telling him that it wants to take dominion over his life. And later on as we read, he takes this man's life, his own brother, his own flesh and blood. Ain't too many other brothers around. Adam and Eve, him and, him and Abel. And he takes his brother's life. And the reason why is because his mindset had changed. And there was nothing that anybody could say to him that was going to re rearrange that or change that from his life. And God, amen, uh, wants to be able to speak it to our hearts and our lives uh, to change uh, our way of thinking or our mindset. Transformation thinking. Do what it is that God has for our lives. And beloved, the very fact is, is that this can happen uh, to either, either one of us. Maybe you don't go to the, to, the, to the very brink of murder, but a lot of times in our heart and our spirit, there's a lot of times, man, words, if we could, there wouldn't be a lot of people walking around. <laughs> if we could and get away with it, there'd be a lot of things not said and stuff that's done. And here it is, God wants to help us. And sometimes he uses people that you might not necessarily get along with at that particular time. He'll use situations or circumstances that might not always be favorable to you the way they spoke it. There's a lot of times that people say something to my life. I'm like, you know what? I don't like the way you just said that. <laughs> I don't like the way your spirit came about it. I don't but I look at the situation. I'm like, am I wrong? If there's something here that's not right, then I need to correct it. I don't care who it is. Beloved, you know, I'm a little bit older in life. But if a seven-year-old was to come up to me, it would say, Hey, your zipper's down. I'm not going to say, who are you? <laughs> How do, what have you did for God? What have you do, or do you, are you potty trained? How can you tell me what, what I'm doing? My, hey, they're at that level. <laughs> they're at a level that they can see things that maybe you don't see. And at the very least, beloved, I would check myself. <laughs> I would like, okay, you know, you know, I would examine myself to see uh, if they're right. That's no different when somebody is speaking to your life. They see stuff, beloved, that you might not see. And they're speaking to you not to try to embarrass you. Hopefully that seven-year-old caught me before I came into the church and say, hey, you need to check yourself and rearrange some things and get yourself so, you, you know, you're covered. And here it is, beloved. A lot of times people are trying to speak into your life, not to hurt and embarrass you, but to help you so that you can examine yourself, look at yourself and say, okay, what do I need to change here? Because obviously something's not right. And God wants to do a, a miracle in our lives, beloved, because we hear more of what the world says about us than what God says about us. Every day, either through the radio or some kind of a media communication, through billboards, or through various other things that go around in our lives, uh, we hear a lot about what the world says our mindset should be. Uh, you should uh, go to this kind of school. You should uh, eat this type of food. You should uh, walk this kind of way. You should uh, drive this kind of car. You should uh, dress this kind of way. And here it is, sometimes very little do we get of what God's perspective is for our lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, God is speaking here, amen, through the apostle Paul to the Corinthian church, the church there in Corinth. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, Paul is writing here, and he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, 
and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Here it is in these verses of scripture, Paul is writing to the Corinth church and he's telling them you can develop a mindset that, that is contrary to what God wants, to what God is trying to speak into your life. And you need to be able to take God's word and you say, you know what, that's what God says about me. The world might say that I'm a loser, but God says I'm a child of God. The world might say that I can't make it, but God says I'm there for you always. The world might say that we don't care, we don't love you, but in God's word he says you're precious to me. And I favor you, and I love you, and I died for you. And here it is, beloved, uh, we need to take into perspective what God thinks uh, more than what the world thinks. Uh, and when our mindset has been changed, uh, we need to go back to the word of God, uh, go back to our prayer closet, uh, go back to where God wants to speak to us and say, God, uh, what are you trying to tell me? Let my mindset change. Let me, amen, be able to hear from you, God, so that I can change the perspective of where I'm going and what I'm doing in life. I remember when I first got saved, beloved, I had a whole lot of mindsets that was in there. And uh, I was just talking to one of the other brothers. Uh, we were, um, had a fellowship, and uh, we were talking about one of the other um, uh, the pastors. He's out, and his, his son is uh, um, out there with him. You know, his whole family is. His son has grown, is older now. And so um, he was asking one of the brothers here, hey, come out here, see me, come out here, visit, because they had a relationship that was younger. He says, okay, man, cool. And so um, he's like, um, what are we going to be doing and stuff? Oh, man. I want to take you out with me and stuff, man. We want to go and uh, 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 go out in the woods and stuff. Um, he said, oh, you want to go hunting? Because this guy loves to hunt. Got all kinds of guns. No, I want us to go out there to see if we could find Bigfoot. <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> he said, dude, what's wrong with you? I'm not going in no woods for the find. You might find something that looks like a Bigfoot. There's all kinds of crazy bums around there that don't shave. But that don't mean that's what he is. But here it is, beloved. He was just messing with them. And, and, but, hey, you know, people believe that stuff. And I'm not trying to knock you if you do or not. I guess I am. But here it is, beloved. We develop all these crazy mindsets about life, about what we think life should be, about way the way we should think life should go. But here it is, beloved. God is trying to get us to understand something. Our perspective needs to change. We need to allow God to have right of way in our lives. There was this one young, young man and what had happened is that he was in school, and so um, his um, mom at the time, his parents, uh, wanted to make sure that their son was uh, going in the right path. And they was telling them, while you're in school, I want you to take the SAT. And I don't know if they uh, do that nowadays. It's basically, uh, it's an entrance exam for you to be able to get into college. This kid was like, that's the last thing I want to do. But he wanted to please his mom. So he takes this uh, SAT while he's still in school. He's a sophomore in high school. So um, he takes it, amen, and so um, later on after the test is over with, uh, some weeks, months pass, and so uh, he gets his um, SAT scores back from the school. He scored a 1480. Now, if you don't know anything about the SAT, a 1480 is one of the highest percentiles that you can get on that. I think the, the most you can get if you got 100%, which you won't get, I think it's like 1600 or 15 something or something of that nature. He was in a one percentile in the whole country that had made it that way. And so the first thing his mom asked him when she seen the test score, she's like, did you cheat? <laughs> He's like, no, mom, I didn't cheat. I tried to cheat, but you can't cheat on that test. <laughs> and so here it is. He was so impressed by a test score. And so something changed to this man. He began to stop skipping school. Cause hey, he's in the one percentile, he needs to be in class. He stopped hanging out with a lot of his friends who used to smoke, go out party, go out drinking, uh, and not study or be in class. Uh, his teachers began, because he had got this high test score, they began to uh, change the way that they approached this young man, tried to help him more, because obviously he must be a gifted kid. So here it is, uh, because of that, beloved, uh, he began to uh, invest more into his studies, uh, began to uh, uh, be more involved in what was going on in the school, uh, and he graduates, amen, uh, with a higher uh, uh, grade point average than what he previously had ever had. And once he uh, graduates from there, he goes to college. Uh, and from college, uh, from a junior college, he goes to a four-year university, uh, and later on, uh, he's there talking about this very same thing that had happened. Uh, and what had happened, beloved, he had, uh, in seven years, uh, had made himself uh, into this business that he was involved with, uh, and he became uh, a multimillionaire. And he's speaking to a crowd uh, of uh, a thousand or so people, telling them about uh, what it is uh, that if you give yourself uh, and work hard, that you can accomplish more than what you thought you could on your own. 
because his perspective changed. His mindset had changed about him, about what it is to be accomplished, about what it is to go in the way that you should in life. It did something to him. Here in Luke chapter 5, verses 4 through 7, another very familiar portion of Scripture, it's talking about Jesus when he's there before he begins to bring the disciples in. And so what had happened is uh, that Jesus is preaching right there on the bank of uh, the, uh, the Galilee, and he's uh, there uh, ministering to the many people that are there, um, and, he, uh, and he's talking to them. Uh, and then uh, he begins to uh, um, talk to um, Simon Peter because he asked him, hey, can I step into your boat to, to move away from the crowd a little bit so that people can see me? And so he says, sure. Uh, he lets him use his boat, and, and Jesus is still ministering. He's ministering for a very long time. Uh, then he turns to Peter, um, and we catch it right here uh, in, uh, in Mark chapter 8, verses, uh, I'm sorry, in Luke chapter 5, uh, verses um, 4 through 7. And Jesus speaks here, and he says, when he has stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Here it is in these verses of scripture. Uh, 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 there's being written here about this, uh, this um, uh, transaction that had happened. And Peter is there uh, and he's saying, uh, we've uh, fished all night long. Now this is a man that had uh, experience being a fisherman. This is what his trade was. Some commentators believe that he was in debt and had to uh, bring in a certain amount of fish in order to pay off a debt. Uh, others were saying that he was just there uh, doing what he normally does uh, in fishing for fish, uh, but he caught nothing. Uh, and a lot of times, they mean, uh, when my, uh, if I stayed any closer to the ocean, uh, my in-laws would be living with me because my father-in-law loves to go fishing. And so he, early in the morning, it ain't like we got yeah, 6 o'clock, nope. 5.30? No. We go in like 3 o'clock in the morning uh, and then he gets ready uh, to go fishing because he's going out there uh, and you're there all day long if you're going to be there fishing and stuff. Uh, and so whether you catch nothing or not, oh, it's just the fun. There ain't no fun, man. You ain't catching nothing, man. <laughs> I'm dying out here. Where's the sandwiches? Where's the barbecue pit? Let's make something happen here. And here it is, beloved. Uh, they fished all that night. And I'm pretty sure that Peter was tired. As a matter of fact, uh, in some uh, um, verses of Scripture, it said he was mending his nets. And then Jesus says, hey, let's go out there and go fishing again. Says, really? <laughs> hey, you did a good sermon there, uh, uh, Pastor Jesus, but ain't no way I'm going back out there, man. I've been out there all night long. But he doesn't say that. He says to him, at your word, I go let down the net. I go out one more time. And is that his word, beloved, uh, that he catches this great huge amount of fish because uh, Simon Peter's mindset had changed. And he begins to do what Jesus had told him to do. How many times has God spoken to your life to say, I want you to do th thus and so? How many times has you been driving down the street and you maybe uh, you're there at a stoplight and God begins to tell you, why don't you go witness to that person? How many times have God begun to move upon you at late at night, amen, to get up and pray for a particular situation that you probably don't even know what's going on or for a particular person because they're going through something? How many times has God brought up your heart to give a certain amount of money? It's like, hey, man, it's Christmas time. <laughs> Let's think about this and into the new year, not at right now at this time of the year. <laughs> and here it is, beloved, God is speaking. Can he change your mindset? Can he speak to your heart and your life uh, to get you uh, to do something totally different from the way that you're thinking at that particular time? God moved upon Peter, and because of that, he saw a miracle. He saw a miracle. Some commentators believe that Jesus, being the, the son of God, knew uh, where the fish would be at and told him to throw it over there on this side of the net. Uh, others uh, believe that, uh, that the God was able to create uh, a school of fish going through there at that particular time, uh, that he was able to catch those fish. Uh, whatever the case may be, uh, all Jesus said is, uh, go out again. Do it again. Do it again. But we've outreached all day long. Do it again. But God, I've been praying about the same situation for years, do it again. But God, I've been given. Uh, I'm giving out. I ain't got nothing else to give. Oh, I got a bonus. Do it again. <laughs> do it again. 
And here, beloved, God is speaking to us to do that again, not for uh, just for our glory, but for his glory. Because as we do that, beloved, uh, God could do uh, a miracle that we can see. Uh, something can transpire. Something can change. Uh, the situation, amen, uh, that seemed dormant before uh, may come to life once and again. Uh, God can move. God can break down doors uh, and help us in the very thing that we've been praying about all this time. Uh, one more time. Just do it one more time and believe God because it's at his word that we do it again and we allow him to have right of wearing our hearts and our lives. And at this particular time, Peter's heart was softened that he can hear from him. Again, we see later on in, in Mark chapter 8 that Jesus is speaking. And here in Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 33, Jesus was just um, um, with his disciples. They're talking, uh, and he's asking them, who do people say that I am? And they say uh, uh, this, that, and the other. Some Elijah, some thank you, uh, one of the old prophets. And uh, Jesus breaks it down. He said, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter says, you're the son of the living God. That's who you are. He begins to applaud him in a sense, in a way, it's like, a, you know, a flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but the, my Father in heaven. And then uh, we want to take it up right here, Mark chapter 8, verses uh, 31 through 33. It's a long time uh, from being there in Galilee. And he says to him, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him to the side and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Say, like, oh, what you just call me? <laughs> Say, hey, man, I kind of like pulled you to the side and said this. But here it is. Before when Jesus was speaking, he did say that he was the son of the living God. Before when Jesus would speak, whatever you say, Lord, we're on it. Yes, I would drop down my nets again. Yes, I would do it again. But we're some time down the road a little bit. Peter's gotten some revelation of who Jesus is. He spoke about it when nobody else would. You know, a little star on there. You know, I'm, I'm doing good, God. And here it is. This is the son of the living God. He is truth. He speaks nothing but truth. This is what I'm going to do. This is how things are going to go down. This is how my life. Hey, come over here. Truth. It's never not going to be that way. You don't have to do these things. And the reason I believe that Jesus spoke so harshly, because even though he pulled into his side, Peter's probably like me with a big mouth. So his disciples probably heard it when he was rebuking them. And Jesus is like, this is not the spirit that I'm giving you. Because it's a sacrificial lifestyle that we live in. And here it is, beloved. Uh, he said, you're not mindful of the things of God. He says, Satan, get thee behind me. And he begins to deal harshly with Peter. And here it is. Uh, before, amen, uh, he was being uh, 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 applauded or saying, uh, yes, uh, God has revealed this to you. Uh, and before, uh, he was dropping down the nets, uh, doing what God wants for his life. But after a course of time, uh, things begin to change. Sometimes, beloved, uh, when we first get saved, we'll do anything for Jesus. But as we go on in life, we start wanting to rebuke Jesus. That ain't God. Why would God tell you not to give? That ain't God. <laughs> that ain't God. Why would God tell you not to pray for somebody? <laughs> Anything will get saved. That ain't God. Things that God begin to deal with you personally that nobody else knows about. Because God doesn't put this big old revelation that everybody sees about your life and what he's speaking to you. It's just you and God sometimes. And it's easy to brush that off because nobody else hears it. And God begins to deal with you. And we begin to rebuke that. And here it is. We wonder, why are things not going the way we should? And God is trying to tell you something. At my word, let my spirit move in your life. Let it be the cause of what God has for you. And beloved, there is no Christian that won't go through this. There is no Christian won't come to a place or a point in their lives where they're not going to need God to move in their lives. And I want to close, beloved, with God's will being done. In Luke chapter 22, verses 41 through 43, Jesus is here with the disciples and he's praying. 
And here, beloved, uh, what had happened, we were down uh, to where Jesus, amen, uh, had already uh, had the Last Supper. Uh, everything uh, was going there. They were singing hymns, and it was going, amen, uh, there to the place they always go is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, and while they're there, amen, uh, they're talking. Uh, thank you, brother, for the word. I really appreciate it because I go, <laughs> I feel myself getting parched, amen. And in this verse of Scripture, Jesus is speaking right here, and he's crying out for what's going. In verse 41, Luke 22, it says, And he withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like drops of blood, Fallen to the ground. Here in these verses of scripture, Jesus is crying out. And he's saying, God, if it's possible, let not my will, but your will be done. Way before he went to Calvary, beloved, he won his battle in Gethsemane. Because it's right here that he is praying. Nobody else, those that was closest to him, first it was the twelve. Then he asked for, I'm sorry, the, uh, the 11, because Judas wasn't there. Then he asked for the three. Pray with me. Pray with me. Sometimes, beloved, your brothers and sisters, they try to do the best they can, but they're human too. And I know if it was me, it's past midnight. We just ate a huge meal, and then we had to walk to where we walked to. That's it. <laughs> Pray with me. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, Lord, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm dead, man. I'm dead. Jesus wakes him up three times. Oh, my bad, my bad, Jesus. Jesus, my bad, man. I, I was trying, yeah, I got you, I got you. All they heard was whatever he began to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're out. Sometimes, beloved, it'll feel like you're walking this road alone. And you're there. And you're crying out to God. God, help me. God, my mindset, everything that's coming against me, God, you're going to have to help me. And it's right here, beloved, that God can strengthen you, that God can move for you. This is the blueprint, beloved, uh, that we need to have for our lives. He prayed it through. He prayed it through to victory. And here it is, beloved. God moved in this situation. It says an angel of the Lord came and strengthened him. Many uh, um, doctors believe that, uh, and I've said this before, and I repeat it again, that um, in your, your brain, amen, uh, there's um, places where the capillary tubes, amen, they don't connect. But because uh, they're close enough, uh, the blood, amen, by each uh, 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 blood cell is able to uh, transfer itself um, from the one capillary tube to the other uh, right in there, even though they're not connecting. But they said if you're under great stress or agony, uh, which is very rare that it would come to this condition, uh, that those blood cells, amen, would begin to basically come out of your skin and begin to come out uh, like drops of blood. He was in very much distress. This wasn't something easy that was going down. Jesus was in a place of agony. And he's praying, Lord, your will be done. I'm telling you, my brother, my sister, there's going to be times and seasons when you think you're doing everything right and everything you can do. And sometimes all you can do and ask for is, Lord, help me. Lord, let my mindset change. Because I know what everybody else says here. I know how things go here. But God, I'm going to need you. I'm going to need you to move for me. I'm going to need you to break for me whatever yoke that it is that's trying to captivate itself on your mind. And allow God to have right away in your life. Some things, beloved, you're just going to have to pray through. And here it is. This gentleman that had made it to a multimillionaire. He's speaking to the people. And what had happened, he had went home later on after doing some of the seminars that he was doing. And when he's there, he's at home and his uh, wife says, hey, there's a letter that came in the mail for you. And he's like, uh, and it's from the, the school district he used to be a part of. He's like, I, I catch it sometimes. They probably want me to go over there to, to meet or to talk or whatever. And so she's like, well, you should actually open it. So some days go by, so he finally opens it. And he reads the letter. 
And in the letter, they're telling him, dear such and such, um, this rarely happens, but so many years ago on the SAT scores, there was a mistake that had happened. Your SAT score said you had made a 1480. There was a mistake. You actually made a 760. You didn't make 1480. His actual test score was a 760. And so what had happened, there was a gentleman that was in the, the seminar that he had gave, and he actually talks about that later on in another one. And so the dad is talking to his son. This dad was there at that seminar. He goes up, and he's talking to his son. and says, hey, did you take the SAT scores yet? I mean, take the SAT. He said, no, no, dad, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it one day. And, um, and so his, his dad re re relates his story to his son. He's saying, oh, so he was always a 1480. You know, the test just uh, made a mistake. This. He said, no. That wasn't the case. He was a 760. That was what he could physically do academically. But he acted like he was a 1480. And because of that, that changed the whole dynamics of his entire life. Because he acted like that's what he was. It's easy, beloved, to play a Christian. It's something else to act like a Christian. It's something else to have that mindset then when you're going through things, no, this is what Jesus says. It's something else when you're going through things uh, and life uh, makes, a, makes you make a U-turn or a curve or something happens in your life. Uh, it's easy when life is going uh, the right way, uh, when things are happening for you, but when there's a twist or a turn, uh, it's something else to do something else. Beloved, you can always tell Christians on the freeway, amen, well, I guess so. I mean, I mean somebody cuts you off in the middle of traffic, oh, beloved. You gotta get your heart right. <laughs> but here it is, beloved. Pastor uh, 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 Joe Campbell always says it's easy to act like a Christian, it's something else to react like a Christian. Yeah. And here it is, beloved. Jesus is showing us the blueprint. Some things you just need to pray through and let your mindset change. Let your cane never could catch that. God Almighty speaks to this man, and he brushes it off. And because of that, his life goes a totally different direction. Just a mindset. Nothing's happened at this time. He hasn't killed his brother, but in his heart, things were changing. And beloved, life has a way of changing some things. It has a way because somebody did something wrong to you. Somebody owed you money and never paid it back. Somebody says something to lie to you about your family or, or, or your friends. Somebody hurt you in some way. It's easy, beloved, to get a different mindset and perspective of things. And you ain't did nothing yet, but inside your spirit and your heart, it's like, that's wrong. And I've never been right about that. My justice hasn't been done. And because of that, our hearts and our minds begin to change. Yeah, we're still here, but in our hearts and spirits, we're someplace else. And God is saying right here, let your heart and your mind come back to me. Let it, God, let the spirit of God be able to change the way you're going. Because here it is. This kid was going to be a dropout in high school and became a multimillionaire because his mindset was different. I want to encourage you, beloved. Let the spirit of God change the way that you're going. Allow God's holy power to move in your life. And as you do that, amen, God can get the glory. God can move through your life. God can help you. He can make breakthrough where there was no breakthrough. He can give you victory where there was defeat. I'm a living testimony, beloved, and there's many more that is here. Because of what God has done, he's changed some things. Because of what God has done, I'm not a drug addict. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not out running the streets. Why? Because God was able to change my mindset and kept it changed. He's able to help me uh, to break uh, old uh, inherited curses, uh, to break, amen, uh, curses that have been brought on from generation to generation. Uh, he's done something in me. Why? Uh, because God has changed my mind uh, and I've allowed it to continue to be changed. I'm no longer the same way I used to be. Uh, my children would never have to deal with some of the dynamics uh, that I had to deal with. Why? Uh, because my mind was changed uh, and I let it continue to be changed. It doesn't matter how old I am. Uh, it doesn't matter what I'm going through in life. Uh, yes, there may be setbacks. Uh, yes, there may be things going on. Uh, but as God is able to speak to me uh, and I say, yes, Lord, uh, he's able to change my mind. 
And he's able to continue to break things in me. Uh, that's the only way, beloved, uh, that this dying generation uh, is going to see the glory of God. Uh, and that is through your life. Uh, as you allow God to change your mind, uh, as you allow God to move through you, uh, people will see that. And they say, uh, that's nothing else but God. Because I know how that person would be. I know how I would react. But they don't react the same way. Why don't you react the same way I do? Well, I got saved. God changed something in me, and I stay saved. I stay saved. I'm telling you, beloved, August the 21st, 1991, God changed my mind. And here it is, December the 26th, 2021, my mind still changed. Amen. Still going in that same direction. Still trying to have hope and breakthrough. Why? Because God is real. And at the end of the, at the, end of the day, God is is going to get the glory. I'd like to have every head bowed and every eye closed and reverence to God. Appreciate everyone being here this evening, amen. Praise God. Maybe you're out there, amen, not knowing everyone's heart out there. And you say, you know what, Mike? My heart's not right with the Lord. I'm not saved. I've just been playing the role, playing the game, but right now, my heart's grown cold to the things of God. And you say, you know what, Mike? Please pray for me. I want to accept Jesus Christ in my heart. You want to show that with the uplifted hand in this place. Every head's bowed and every eye's closed and reverence to God. You'll say, you know what, Mike? Please pray for me. I want to accept Jesus Christ in my heart. Or maybe you're out there, amen, and you're backsliding in your heart. That means at one time you was on fire for God, but right now your heart's grown cold. And you're saying, you know what? My heart's not right with the Lord. I'm backsliding in my heart. You want to say, please, Mike, pray for me. I want to accept Jesus Christ in my heart. And you want to show that with the uplifted hand in this place, uh, saying, Mike, please pray for me. I want to accept Jesus. I'm tired of being tired, amen, uh, and I want the Lord to help me in my life. Now, I want to talk to God's people. I want to encourage you, beloved. Allow God's spirit to touch your life. And I know he's touched it before, but let him touch it again. Let it help you to change uh, the way that maybe you've been thinking or going. I know uh, there have been times or seasons in our lives that sometimes setbacks uh, makes us uh, in our minds uh, hold back from the things of God. But I don't want to encourage you, beloved. Uh, a setback is only uh, the reaction before a comeback. And God wants to do a miracle in your life. Uh, allow him and his presence to move in you uh, and to touch and change your life. Uh, let's just stand in this place. Um, these altars are open. Uh, if you want to come, find a place to pray. Uh, the rest of us, let's just stand. Uh, we're going to sing the song as our brother leads us and worship unto God.